Hello everyone, good afternoon and a warm welcome to the latest uh, Froebel Trust webinar. I'm delighted you're able to join us today uh, for this very special celebration um, and the launch of a new publication by Stephanie Harding and Felicity Thomas, a very important book which the Froebel Trust has been very grateful to the authors for uh, giving us permission to publish on our website as a free viewable and downloadable document, growing a nursery school from seed the first 75 years. We're also very grateful to have Marion Whitehead joining uh, our authors today. Um, and uh, Marion, Felicity and Steph will introduce themselves in just a few moments. Um, my name's Sasha Powell. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Froebel Trust. I, um, I'm very pleased that in this series of webinars, we've been able to launch um, a number of new publications and there will be more to come. If you do go onto our website to download this wonderful book, please do have a look around the website where you'll find many other resources. Some of you will no doubt have taken part in a recent webinar where we launched one of our pamphlets. Um, we now have six pamphlets, so please do have a look at those and um, indeed all the other resources on our website. Uh, this webinar is being recorded today, so you will be able to look at the recording. Again, that will be available on our website in a few days time. And if you know of colleagues who haven't been able to attend today but would enjoy watching the webinar, then do that. let them know about that, please. Um, the webinar is going to be divided into three parts and we will be pausing um, uh, on two occasions during uh, the presentation to take your comments and questions. Um, if you're familiar with, with Zoom, you'll see, uh, you'll know, that, and if not familiar, you'll see at the bottom of the screen, um, there is a little icon that says Q&A, and that's where you can type in um, questions and comments uh, for our presenters today. Please don't hold back. Uh, we welcome, and indeed they welcome, your comments and questions. And when we pause, I will be um, presenting those questions to uh, Stephanie, Felicity and Marion, um, who will be glad to answer them. Um, and at the very end, uh, once they finish their presentation, there'll be a, a third chance to um, put those questions to them. So without further ado, I am going to hand over uh, to Felicity, Stephanie and Marion to introduce themselves. Um, and I'm going to invite them now to, to unmute and to turn on their videos, please. And I shall disappear momentarily. And I will be back with you um, shortly um, for the Q&A section. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sasha and thank you everybody for uh, joining the, the webinar. Um, we're going to do introductions first and tell you a little bit about ourselves. So and I'm going to start that off by introducing myself. My name's Felicity Thomas and I'm one of the co-authors of this book. Um, just to give you a bit of background about me and why this book has been published by the Froebel Trust um, is that I am a Froebel teacher. I trained at the Froebel Institute. But before that, uh, when I was a child, I went to a Froebel school, a school that had all Froebel teachers in it. And I was very, very happy there. We had um, lots of exploring, lots of going out, understanding nature, being in nature, learning in nature. And we did most of our lessons linked to what Froebel would call occupations, but we might see them as workshops or art, art and craft. Um, so one of the things as an example is that when we read The Hobbit, we then all had to uh, choose a character, and I was Bilbo Baggins, and we made puppets of our character about how we thought they would be from our understanding of the book. And then we presented the book as a puppet show in our own words. So it was linking all the time your learning with a task or an occupation to make it very real. Um, and that I think made a big impression on me. And when I decided I wanted to be a teacher, I only wanted to be a Froebel teacher. 
And if I didn't get in to the Froebel Institute, I wasn't going to be a teacher. So I did get in happily <laughs> and became a teacher. And I've worked um, in, I started off working in London and then I uh, went to Australia for a while and I taught out there. Then I came back and taught in Devon, all in nurseries and reception class. And then I um, finished teaching in Norwich um, at the nursery school there, which is what we've, we've written about. And then when I retired, I was invited to join Professor Tina Bruce and some other like-minded teachers to learn more and go deeper into the meaning of Froebel and become a Froebel traveling tutor, which I now am. And so I feel really I've gone full circle from going to school in a Froebel school and teaching and then now being a Froebel traveling tutor. So that's that's my background and it's all very linked in ways to Froebel. So I would like now to hand you over to Steph, who's going to tell you a little bit about herself. Okay, Steph? Yep. Hi, I'm Steph Harding and Felicity and I started at the nursery on the very same day. I was um, um, learning to teach and Felicity was the deputy head. And over time, we discovered that we have a similarly, similar view of education for very young children, even though we have different frameworks for working with them. <laughs> We're very different sometimes, but I'm really pleased that you can join us for celebrating this publication, which is what we've wanted to work towards since, well, Felicity retired in January 2013 and I retired in August 2016, and we got together after that to think about how we could share our journey, which we thought was very important because at times we felt very isolated and um, unsupported in a way, but only through lack of information. We thought that if we wrote, if we could publish something that was accessible by lots of people, then they wouldn't have to feel like that because they could refer to our journey. So I'd like to thank some of the colleagues that have helped us on this journey. So the head before Felicity, Janet Edgar, um, Margaret, Donna, Caroline and Jane, who've all helped us with interviews, with diaries and with photographs to pull together resources to write about times that we weren't there, the time before we started. We also use resources from outside. Um, we made good use of the library and of the Norfolk Record Office where um, I found the opening pamphlet. It's got a plan of the nursery in May 1939 when it was the opening day. In addition, I use, made really good use of the school log, which was completely fascinating. All the head teachers filled it in in very different ways. Sorry, and, yeah, um, <laughs> and at the back of the book, it showed a list of all the staff, um, what, what date they came, what date they left, but more interesting, how they've been trained and what the um, organisation was that they've been trained from in their early years practice. So, and I talk a bit about that in the, in the book. So this is a, a, a very, a story about a very particular um, school and a very particular time and looks at it in terms of its social and historical context so both a national context and a local context and that gives you a better a view and understanding of how things um, developed. It's, it's got resonances both in the past and in the present I think which we can hopefully provide a resource for other people of how to tackle challenges that are occurring. And one of the particular resonances that I was thinking of recently is that after the war was announced, the nursery closed, but its kitchen provided food for necessitous, is what they called it, necessitous families. And I was thinking about the discussions around 
providing food for those families that are finding it challenging in uh, these times. We're also part of, as Marion had pointed out to us, a, a literary tradition. So a tradition of people writing about or having written about um, establishing schools and trying to um, implement what they thought was best for young children, uh, which was sometimes against the orthodox view. So The Idiot Teacher by Gerard Holmes, she introduced us to, and An Experiment in Education by Sybil Marshall. And hopefully this will contribute in a similar way to people's understanding of early education and education generally. And hopefully the Global Trust will be able to get more people to contribute their own histories and particular circumstances. Um, I really wanted to make this book um, in the service of giving people information about how to develop their own practice with a curriculum that can reflect local strengths and local communities. And it was very, very heartening to read in October's Nursery World, an account by N Family Club in London, who seemed to be on a similar journey to the one that we've taken. And it was very interesting to read that. And hopefully that also will help people who want to begin a similar journey. So now I'd like to hand over to Marion so she can tell us about how she's her role and how that's developed for her. Marion. Thanks, Steph. Thank you. <clears throat> um, my name is Marion Whitehead. And I don't seem to be appearing on the screen yet, am I? <laughs> yeah, we can see you. Am I there? Okay, good, okay. Um, I was formerly a senior lecturer in education at Goldsmiths in the University of London. And then I was responsible for organising and teaching MA degrees in early childhood education and in language and literacy in early childhood education. Um, over the years, I've published several books, and one of these, Language and Literacy in the Early Years, is now in its fourth edition. I've published research articles, and until recently, I was an editor of the Early Years International Journal of Research. But my links with Earlham start really in 1998. I was invited to be the critical friend of Earlham Nursery School by Felicity, uh, and I'm sure with Steph aiding and abetting her. Um, and in fact, the very early stages of this work as we started it is described and analysed in the Early Childhood Practice Journal, which I'm sure many of you will know. Um, it, is, it was in fact a lovely piece, that, um, article that was produced well, the whole journal was produced by Tina, Tina Bruce, and this is the 2000, year 2000, we published the early stages of working with a critical friend. So um, surely there must be a job description for a critical friend. Well, in my particular slant, if you like, um, I think of it as being a facilitator and a provoker, a provoker of process. The process of practitioners and children and a community learning and growing together. Um, of course, being a critical friend fits in with um, the action research tradition. And I often think of my own definition, well, my favourite definition of action research is a process of self-reflective inquiry by practitioners into their own practice in order to improve that practice. So with that behind us, um, I found that a few essential criteria for the critical friend became very important. So if I can list those, um, the critical friend is friendly, but professional. The critical friend has a respected reputation or track record. And the critical friend is not in an official assessment or inspection role. Uh, the critical friend contributes her own depth and breadth of experience and knowledge, which is the value of the, being the outsider and who brings a whole world of different experiences and different early years institutions to bear on the thoughts of the practitioner she's working with. So, but the critical friend is involved in the institution or the community and is very critical. Um, and finally, the critical friend is never remote and never judgmental. I was always at the end of a phone or at the end of an email. 
Well, there have been times when we've all shouted, we need to talk. <laughs> um, but of course, for myself, the critical friend has to cope with rather a lot of steep and challenging learning curves. There were things I had to struggle with and found difficult. Um, I was not experienced in meeting with a whole range of other social and caring services that impinge on an early years setting. I was not at the beginning an expert on babies and toddlers who are within an educational setting. Um, I had parents' questions sometimes to deal with. My favourite being a dad waylaying us all and saying, who's that Marion Whitehead then? I keep hearing about her. So um, you have to take it all on the chin. Um, and of course, like many of the people at Earlham, initially I found the huge size of our wonderful magical garden quite challenging. Um, and I had to wander in it a lot to find myself and work out what I was doing there. The agenda for our work was all set by the nursery team. They were in their own constant cycle of interrogating, changing and improving their practice. For example, in the very early years, we started with questioning the language curriculum, or the team did with my involvement. But later, we were responding to inappropriate external assessment demands. And in order to respond appropriately to those, we had to evolve eventually a dispositions curriculum. So that meant studying the work of Lillian Katz, the New Zealand Early Years curriculum, schemas and the work of Chris Athey and Cathy Nutbram. And we had to evolve completely new and quite radical approaches to record keeping at Earlham. So that was where we were at. Um, what stuck with me all the time and has kept me totally involved with Earlham has been the fact that the children were always seen as powerful thinkers and learners and their families and the wider community were seen as educators and sources of cultural insights. So at this point, I think Steph will be ready to talk to you about what makes this book different. And I have to say, this really is not just another early years book. Okay, Steph, over to you. Thank you, Mary. So um, I think what makes this book different is it's not just an account of our journey, but it also locates the nursery within a historical, both national and local, and a social context and looks at other things which might constrain or enable children's learning. So I really enjoyed um, looking at the history of early education. So it's got a section from that looks at sort of from the late 18th century and that hi history often reveals a tension between two different models of looking at early education. The model which sees children as passive receivers of information and puts the adult role into a rather didactic nature and which is emphasised above that of the children. And the other approach, which centers on the curious and active child whose learning is facilitated by an actively observant adult who analyzes their observations. And there's a fascinating pull between these different models throughout history. And I hope that this publication is gonna contribute to discussions that from changes that happen from now, because I'm sure that pull between those two models is going to continue. There's also a look at local history, which gives you an insight into the dynamics of the local community and how they're perceived both internally and externally. And that's helpful in understanding your local community and how it changes through the years, because ours certainly did over 20 years. The second piece of this um, publication that I've really, really enjoyed doing is looking at the architecture. So it's a 1930s building, as you can see, and it was conceived at a time when civic architecture was trying to um, respect and give quality facilities to working families. So very different from today's context. And it was built by, it was designed by somebody called J. Nelson Meredith, 
who'd worked in Liverpool and worked for a company who were very inter interested in civic architecture. And I think he worked on Stormont, or that company did. Then he was engaged as the first city architect in Norwich. And when he left Norwich, he went on to be the city architect for Bristol and um, supported the build building and design of such places of what was called Causton Hall. Um, so I found a really good book while I was looking at this. It's this. It's called The Design of Nursery and Elementary Schools and was published by the Architectural Press. And it comes from the Haddow Report of 1933, which the government held these reports um, to look at education and how they could support it in the best possible way. And the outcome of uh, that report, it describes a sort of really good nursery school, what it should contain, how it should be organised, and it was very much influenced by Margaret Macmillan's ideas and Margaret Macmillan herself. I think they made a visit to her school at Deptford. And this book just is an instruction manual in a way for designers of schools and includes schools like Earlham. And I think that um, J. Nelson Meredith must have been influenced by it. It was published in 1938 and the school was built in 1939 and they had a big exhibition before it was published. So I think the ideas, if not the actual publication would have been influential. And some of the most interesting things is that it holds up nursery schools as the model for nursery and infant education. So it sees education in the early years as from two to seven years. And it says that um, infant schools need to be conducted upon nursery lines. It calls classrooms in those schools for two to seven year olds playrooms. And it doesn't see, it, it's very informed by the ideas of educationists. And very interestingly, reports on the experience of a child for, of a day at nursery, which I include in the book, because it's very interesting to compare that to today. Um, so I, I think as well, although it's a really lovely uh, building and those front of those classrooms at one time would have opened completely so children would have had access indoors and outdoors and there's clear story lighting and um, windows to encourage air for children's health again informed by, by Macmillan um, but some of those things which were good at the time and reflected thinking at the time around children's health actually became a constraint over the years so I think buildings reflect um, their time and the ideas of their time and that can be an enabler or it can be a constrainer. I think also um, there's a commitment for developing new, new facilities that fit in with the present ones. So when we developed the garden we wanted it to be seen from all the windows, we wanted children to have access to seeing nature as well as being in it. So hopefully those two things are combined. <laughs> One thing about the building which was really interesting, which I never really got to the bottom of it, was the sculptures on top of the build on top of each classroom. They're mentioned as being built by a company which I couldn't trace. I got in contact with English Heritage and with the organisation which makes an inventory of public sculptures and a book's been written about public sculptures in Norwich but never actually found out who did them and how they were done. They're concrete and they're of um, rabbits, squirrels and mice and in the opening pamphlet for the nursery it mentions how the mice are like Mickey Mouse but they're not at all like Mickey Mouse. They're very of their time and very um, mannered really in their description. So alongside of the building I need to mention the garden because it's a fabulous garden. There were moves to sort of improve it in the 1980s um, but it wasn't until the early excellence project in the 2000s that it really gave us the possibility for developing the garden. It's 0.8 of an acre and we tried to promote a sort of naturalistic environment as Froebel would have encouraged so children could engage with and in nature 
And so all the, the structures are wooden or made of natural materials. And we tried to make it something different. So it wasn't just an outside classroom. It was nature really, where you could explore nature. And when we, different times for improvements, when we had different times for improvement, we tried to engage local artists. So what you see here in the photograph is the camera obscura, which was built by Viv Allen, a local artist who was very interesting, interested in promoting the use of camera obscuras. And for the children, it was a very interesting experience, which Felicity has written down some anecdotes that we'll have to read the book to <laughs> find out about. Um, when it was developed, it was developed alongside with the input of parents, schools, the community, children and staff with big projects around all of those. And the community, we had community planting days to help us plant the environment. And it's developed into a really lovely environment, as Marion would say. But there's a lot more of that in the book. So I'll pass you now to... Sasha to see if you've got any questions about what we've talked about so far. Sasha, do we have anything? Thank you very much Steph and, and Felicity and Marion. Um, gosh, so much research has gone into this book and it's very, been very evident from all the, the topics that you have mentioned already in the first 20 minutes of this presentation. It's fascinating, thank you so much. Um, we uh, I wondered if you could talk a little bit, you, you mentioned uh, buildings being both enablers and constrainers at different times and perhaps reflecting ideas about childhood and education at different times. And you talked about developing the garden. Clearly you had perhaps a greater sense of control over creating the outdoor environment compared with the, the environment that you were effectively given indoors. I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about um, how you might overcome the ways in which the building uh, constrained uh, you and the children. Um, um, I, so, <laughs> um, I think the, 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 the thing about the building was that it had um, a very long wide corridor um, that separated the three classrooms. And we wanted, at one point, we wanted to make access to each other's rooms much easier. And so we looked at if we could make archways or some way of children going from one room to another rather than running. Because you know, when children see a long straight line, they just want to run down it, don't they? So, so we thought about that but the building wouldn't allow us to do it because it's built on a metal ring something can't remember what the architect said it was called and there was you could not make holes in the walls anywhere so we had to rethink um, how we could get children to feel comfortable moving between the classrooms so it's that sort of thing that you had to think about really mm. Thank you. That's a great example. Um, we have a question. Um, I'm afraid I don't know the person's name, but it's about the community um, of the nursery school. And um, our questioner asks, uh, first, first and foremost, whether you had a multicultural community around the nursery school and how you involved people from a variety of cultures in the daily life of the nursery school. So initially there was a very um, static community when Felicity and I first started. Children were there whose grandparents had attended the nursery and there wasn't very much diversity at all. Although within the community there was quite a big traveller population, well settled traveller and traveller population. And apart from that it was quite a static community but over the years it did change and you've got different sorts of a more diverse population coming in but often with not many representative members of any one particular community which was quite difficult um, but we did find different ways of engaging people um, one of which was that we had an international day every year 
and um, we had a committee of people who represented all the different parts of the school and they planned this day and the day was outside we had visitors from other schools and we had other professionals and we provided dance, food, music, stories, lots of different things that came through our families and through the community so we had storytellers we had a fire going. We had over the years. We had lots of different sorts of people. We had a steel band at one point, but mostly we found that was most. The thing we found was most popular was the sharing of food. People really loved to bring their own food and share it with other people, and that was a very popular day at the nursery. Do you want to say anything else about that, Listy? I think the food thing was um, fantastic, really, because people perhaps who lived on the estate who had never tasted, I remember there was one uh, person who had never tasted hummus and um, somebody from Iran, after the Iran-Iraq war had, had come, a father and he'd made the hummus. And uh, this mum ran over to him and said, you must give me this recipe, it is lovely. And they really connected with that, you know changing recipes and food and I think food is a great opener for um, people to communicate with each other. The other thing that we did that I think was uh, successful was that we, we, we were part of a, a project in, in Norfolk um, which had a, um, a twinning with Malawi and uh, so we twinned with a nursery in Malawi and that was, it was so different for the children, the children at Earlham to see. We had pictures of the children at Malawi and the nursery school was in um, a church and the babies were kept in the pulpit, which was, you know, it was a contained area. <laughs> and that's where they were kept. And um, Mrs. Mizen, who, who ran the nursery school, I always remember when she sent us, we sent her some, um, uh, paper and some crayons, things that she had asked for, and she sent us things back. And they were the children had done drawings on uh, seed bags because they had no paper, and they'd used whatever they could find to make the drawings. And I think that was really helpful to talk to our children about. You know, we were classed as an area of depri deprivation. And, and actually the children that we had had so much more than those children that we were making links with in Malawi. And, and we Tim also went to Malawi, didn't he? Sorry, Tim went to Tim Malawi. Went to Malawi. <laughs> we, we did, we used to use persona dolls a lot. So I had a, a persona doll called Tim, <laughs> Steph's referring to. And uh, I used to, whenever I was in the classrooms, I used to take Tim with me and he would, I don't know if people know about persona dolls, but they have a backstory. So Tim's backstory was that he was a looked after child, uh, but he also had red hair. And we had quite a few children, mainly boys actually in the nursery with red hair. And it was a real, um, they loved Tim. I remember one little boy in your class uh, who had red hair, used to always come up to Tim and just pat his hair, you know. Um, but when, um, when we were going for a visit to Malawi, we decided that um, Kettle Foods bought a, a persona doll for the nursery in, in Malawi. And we decided that Tim would go. We made up the story that Tim's um, family were moving to Malawi, so he had to go too. And the children were incredible. They, they talked all about what he needed. He had to have factor 50 because he had red hair. <laughs> He'd get burnt and I bought a little rucksack and then they said what I had to buy for him to go. And he went on his journey to Malawi. So there were lots of sort of things that we tried to do to bring uh, communities to get together and we did have, as time progressed, as Steph said, we had um, a lot of asylum seeker families from the Bosnia-Herzegovina war 
and we had a lot of asylum seekers from the Iran-Iraq war, and we had some refugees, some Congolese refugees who um, worked with us. And so the, we had a lot of uh, migrants also who were economic migrants. So from Poland, Lithuania, Portugal. Um, so the community over the 20 years that we, we were there had been very monocultural when we arrived, <laughs> but actually when we left was very multicultural. <laughs> and we had to learn how, how to um, listen I think yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a question um, from Gillian Holland and a comment from Jane Reed. And I will um, read Jane's comment before I ask you Gillian's question. And then uh, we probably need to move on to the next section. Um, Jane Reed's comment is about terminology. Um, you um, mentioned the word shelters in your quote from Zaha Hadid. Um, and Jane says that uh, Macmillan referred to her nursery rooms as shelters and then playrooms. And now she thinks just classrooms. And Jane mentions that she likes the word shelters. Um, I don't know what you feel about or which was your preference in terms of words for the different rooms or spaces in the nursery. Um, and Gillian Holland's comment is, do you think that being a nursery school was enabling in that you were able to work independently from infant or primary schools? Was that the case? Were you working independently or collaboratively? Um, I think that's a really interesting question. And having worked in nursery classes in school and in nursery schools, it is absolutely true that if you are an entity as a nursery school, it is liberating. Uh, so we could develop our own curriculum, whereas in a school we may, might have had the constraint that we couldn't do that. Um, we could uh, plan and organise our school the way we wanted, the way we felt it was best for our children. Um, but we did run a research project where one of our um, a PGCE student who did her initial training at the nursery went to work in a local school in reception and she wanted to do a trial and we got some money to support her trialling a dispositional curriculum. But the outcome of that is that you can't really do that sort of a curriculum on your own in a separate class. It has to be a whole school commitment and has to engage all the staff in all the work. So. Yeah, I think what you were saying is right. Mm. But I think it's a double-edged sword because... Thank you very much for those comprehensive and... Uh, it's okay. <laughs> sorry, Steph. Do you want okay. to go on? To go on. <laughs> I was just going to say it's a double-edged sword because we were always seen by the school community. So where we had um, meetings with people in our um, feeder schools and things like that, we were always seen as... Um, and not really as professional and the children weren't really doing education and it was a fight to get recognition and understanding and some of that was to do with funding I mean for some reason they always seemed under the, under the misconception that we had a lot more money than them which really wasn't true but I guess that's to do with how you're promoted in the local authority. I don't know. And in Norfolk, there were only, first there were four, and then there was only three nursery schools. So as a group, we weren't really a priority. So a double-edged sword, I think. Sure. And many resonances with today, I'm sure. <laughs> um, I think we'll probably ought to move on. So if I may, I'm going to invite Felicity to carry on with the next part of the presentation, which turns our attention towards adult learners, I believe. Yes, it does. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Sasha. So um, I want to talk a little bit about adult learners because um, all my professional life, I have, and I think probably influenced from my Frodo training, I have uh, seen very clearly that the child is part of a family and the family is part of a community and the community is part of a 
a town and a town is part of the, the, the country. So seeing a child in isolation is not always helpful. So um, I have always been fascinated about how you engage and work with families. Um, and at Earlham, we had very diverse families. Um, and as I said, as the community changed, what we really had to learn to, to listen and understand what those families needed from us um, and not just to keep presenting what we had always presented because needs changed. But also, I think that the slide you've got up here is um, representing something when we first became an early excellence centre uh, back in 2001, and the parents were really, really interested in what an early excellence centre was and what this new building was all about, and what, what was in it for them, you know, why were we doing it? And uh, so we had lots of conversations about the centre being for everybody, you know, it wasn't just a place for children, it was a place for the adults, it was a place for families, it was grandparents, the community could come in um, um, and we could all learn from each other. And the parents really wanted to make a statement about that and they wanted to make something. And um, so I said, well, shall we approach the art school in Norwich and uh, see if we can make something, create something. And uh, this little group of parents who'd lived on this estate all their lives, had been to school on the estate, didn't know that Norwich had an art school. That told me something. It told me something about the education on the estate. Surely education is about broadening people's horizons, enriching their experience. And it felt that these families hadn't, been, hadn't had that from their education. So we, we went to the art school, we had an amazing time and they, they decided that they wanted to make jelly babies. So uh, these are ceramic cast jelly babies painted with cast spray paint. And the children uh, came with us and they made baby ones, which they took home with them. And then these, this, this sculpture was put at the entrance of the nursery school because the parents wanted to make a statement. This was their statement. Everybody is welcome. That's why the jelly baby's arms are out. And it was important that it was there, visible at the entrance, so everybody could see and that the parents knew that it was valued. It was their statement, which was meaningful. And I think it, it's really, really important to engage with your families, to listen to them, to find out what's important for them, and then to allow them to do something as well. Don't take control. Um, and that's, that's always been quite hard for me because I'm a bit of a control freak on the side. But it's, it's really important to stand back and allow everybody to have a say to be part of the vision that you want to develop and to feel that they have put something into it because if you put something into something then you have ownership of it in some way and you feel that you're part of it and this is there are lots of ways that we did this at Earlham um, and one of the, the things that we used, one of the tools which Marion spoke about earlier, was the action research uh, spiral, which we used really from um, when Steph started to do her MA and, or when we started with the EEL programme in 1997, right until Steph left, we did ongoing action research about everything that we wanted to know more about, learn more about, reflect on, improve, embrace. And we didn't just do it around um, the curriculum. 
uh, though we did, we did a lot around the curriculum. Uh, we used it in every area of the nursery. So um, you will have to read the book, Developing a United Vision is the, the chapter. When I actually go through um, examples of all the different action research that we used and how that changed our practice and impacted on children, staff and parents. Um, so one of our youngest members of staff um, wanted to find out about how children respond to different tactile sensations. So, um, because she had noticed in her observations that children see things that we can't see because they go, they go down to the ground and they have a good look. Um, and you will know that children are always saying, look at this, look at this, and you're, you know, desperately trying to see what they can see, which is something tiny on a blade of grass. And so she did this piece of research around the tactile path, which was made from found things from the building work of the nursery. So the children chose what they wanted to put into this path. Uh, so there were shells that were dug up. There was, you can see here, there's um, a manhole cover that we found. Um, there were lots of uh, pieces of um, um, ramp. We had an old, old mobile with some metal ramp and the children loved the ramp. So they retained parts of the ramp and that went into the path. There were old bricks, there were slates. It was um, extensive. It went around in a circle, up the hill and down again. and. Um, we found out a lot about what the children liked. You know, they, were, they loved this ramp, which we all hated because it made such a noise, but they really enjoyed it. And they also liked the rubber footings that the uh, builder's fence went in. So we managed to loin a few of those and put those into the park. So, Again, this was a path that children made from things that interested them. And what a fantastic statement as well for those children to see their interests enshrined in their garden. Again, it's another way of saying this is your place. This is important for you. Um, and it's yours to learn from. So I think thinking of as many different ways to value children's thinking and to show them that their thinking is valued is really important because then they become powerful thinkers and they challenge their own thinking and they challenge your thinking, which is good. Um, so we did this with the children. We did it with staff. We used action research um, back in 1999 to do um, supervision. We felt we needed uh, supervision. Uh, so long before supervision was put into the EYFS, long before the EYFS. Um, but again, staff weren't keen. They were worried about supervision. So we did it as an action research project and staff said what they were worried about why they thought it might be helpful, what they think what the dangers were. So we could structure our supervision around their needs and their fears and their expectations. And so supervision became very meaningful for them. And we actually researched Carl Rogers and we modeled our supervision process on his um, person-centered approach. So supervision wasn't about outcomes. It was about growing the understanding of each other. And that was really important um, for us. So it wasn't about what you've achieved. That was a completely different thing that was imposed by the county, which was appraisal. Supervision isn't appraisal. So it was very important to make that distinction. We also used action research to bring our different services together. So we had um, health visitors, 
we had social workers, we had uh, family support workers, we had nursery nurses, we had teachers, we had you know, admin staff, uh, we had early years practitioners who'd worked in a different environments from us, so day nursery environments. A clinical psychologist. Clinical psychologist, thanks. To <laughs> we had uh, a multiplicity of stuff, and and there was a tension because we came from very different backgrounds. So what we tried to do, and these these two pictures are the representation of this, we tried to think about what we were all passionate about. So the slide on the left is, what are you guardians of? What would you never give up because it's so meaningful to you? Um, and then we had an understanding of where people were coming from. We understood, for instance, that the health visitor felt passionate about advocacy for the parents. We felt passionate about advocacy for the children. So you've got her advocacy in adults and you've got our children's voices <laughs> above it so that we could actually understand where each other were coming from. So we could agree to our differences, but then find our commonalities. And our commonalities were how we wanted the nursery to be in five years time. So that was our picture on the right hand side. It wasn't an easy thing to do, I don't think, um, but it was certainly a worthwhile thing to do because we could understand then why we had different views about things and we could debate it and discuss it because we'd already had that discussion. Um, and we could agree to differ or we could agree to com uh, compromise. Um, but in the main, we, we came down collectively together. And from the nursery, what we felt was that we were there for the children. We developed a priority list for children. And so whenever we came to a sticking point, we could say, but is this going to benefit the children? And if at the end of the day it didn't, then we were not going to do it. Yes, I thought, I thought the priority list was really um, useful, not in terms of the whole team always, but all, often as an individual, like as a head teacher, you have to make all these hundreds of decisions all the time. But sometimes it's really hard to weigh out up what's in the best interest of the team and the children. And the priority list was a really short document of agreed priorities that you could go to and say, does it conform to this? Does it conform to that? And it was a very helpful document in decision making. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Steph, for that. Um, I think finally, I'm looking at the time and I'm, I'm, I mustn't say very much more, but I put this slide in, which is a Froebel quote, Froebel in Lily, because it's about unity. And when I was at the nursery with all Everywhere I've worked, I've always wanted and always striven really to bring people together because I think it's so important to feel united and not to feel separated. And I think we tried really hard at Earlham as an early excellence centre and as a children's centre to bring everybody together, to have a service that was meaningful to everyone. And I know when we first became an early excellence centre, I went and visited a number of excellence centres and I went to one centre where they'd had a lot of money and had been a nursery school and the nursery school did not appear to have benefited from any of this money. So you went in and if you went in for your session or nursery, you turned left into an old building that hadn't really had a coat of paint. If you were coming for a toddler group, a parent group, a baby massage, whatever was your early excellence centre, children's centre uh, activity, you turned right. 
into this amazingly modern, all singing, all dancing building. And I felt so uncomfortable with that because I felt it was a sort of unreflected segregation. And when we got our money for Erlen, I didn't want that. I didn't want a new building. I wanted to upgrade our building and make it right for everybody. So everybody felt that they were going into the same value, whatever their need. Um, and unity is a key Rebellion principle. And I think if you don't have unity, if you have separateness, then you get fragmentation and nothing works. Things start to fall apart. So try, I would say, try and bring things together in a, a unified way if you possibly can. And I know how difficult that is because a lot of our expectations aren't unified that come to us from government. But I'm going to finish there because it's so good. Sure. We've got questions. Thank you very much. Um, we have had a flurry of questions about action research um, and, and one question about the jelly babies. So uh, <laughs> I will start with the jelly baby question because I suspect uh, that might possibly be answered more quickly um, from Tansy Watts, who, who um, is asking about how new uh, families who joined the nursery community responded to the jelly babies and whether you felt that the original intention of the message that they were meant to convey was indeed conveyed to those new families? That's a, that's a brilliant question. Um, I think I think it's, it's actually quite a layered question because I think one of the things is that um, you have to keep revisiting and the jelly babies were not as meaningful and couldn't have been as meaningful 10 years down the line to families that came. Um, but then other things were happening with those families and that we did that allowed them to create things. And I think it's really important that we remember that our community, our staff, our um, expectations are changing all the time. So we have to keep go going back and revisiting and rethinking and redoing. You, you never achieve, it's always a journey. Thank you. Um, so I'll go on to the questions about action research and what I'll do is try to bring them all together so that hopefully you can answer them um, uh, as a whole without me interrupting you. And they're to all three of you, really. Um, the first question is about how you actually went about documenting um, the, the projects, uh, whether you used documentation or was it more of a social and meeting based process? Um, and, uh, and similarly, uh, perhaps as, as a next phase, um, Tina Bruce has asked uh, you specifically, Marion, about how you gathered together um, into a whole, the exciting action research type journeys uh, of different aspects of the work. And then the third question is about you, <laughs> really, uh, Marion, is what role <laughs> you played as a critical friend in the action research. Uh, projects? Uh, I plunge in? <laughs> um, rule, um, my role really was always to be very responsive to the team because it was led by them but my role was always again to provoke them into first of all to set out what were the areas of interest that, or worry that they needed to investigate. I think I mentioned briefly that it was the language curriculum that they started with and that's probably why they invited me to be the critical friend, because they knew of my interest and publications in language and literacy. Um, and I think that's why we started with the language. But it, what happened was that I was involved with everybody by simply beginning this notion of encouraging them to think about what role language played in their everyday work what their rooms, their shelters, if you like, and becoming having a train myself in the Deptford area, or my, you know, mm -hmm. shelters mean a lot to me <laughs> in early years. Um, what, what their shelter was saying to families and to children about language 
and about literacy and about mark making. So it was that sort of very general provoking approach saying, well, what happens when you go in here? Um, you like stories. So where are they? When do you do stories? I mean, is there any limit to how many stories you tell? Um, is there always someone who'll pop down on the carpet and tell a story or read a story? So, you know, it was that taking people with you not marching in and saying, oh, I know a bit about language, so this is how you do it, because I still don't know how you do it, by the way. Um, like all of us, I just plunge in and hope that I'll get there. Um, but it is this issue of asking people to be excited about language, excited about the children. And then again, with such young children, and in the particular circumstances of the estate and at Erlem, it was communication, subtle human communication, that was the area where they needed to look at. And I know both Felicity and Steph became very expert at realizing that a much richer um, form of communication was one that was used a lot in the area and was more important. I sometimes jokingly think, you know, why use, um, you know, 10 words in Norfolk if one will do? And so it was, you know, we had to rethink our own assumptions about language and communication. And um, I think that, you know, maybe Steph and Felicity want to come in now on that. Yeah, That's I how I felt we were working. Marion, often we would say to Marion, um, this is an area that we of concern or we'd like yeah. to find out more about. And she would do some observations of that environment or people working with that environment and then feed back to us and one of the things that she did do that we were concerned about around communication very early on was look at children's communication and feed back to us that we need to be looking at all the non-verbal communication that's going on and not get swayed into only worrying about verbal communication you know where is all the other sorts of communication so that wasn't actually research but that was one of the responsive sort of roles that Marion did you know we're worried about x could you have a look in the nursery and what evidence is there or what's your feeling what's your feedback but in terms of the action research most of it was documented and whenever we had people who were on courses at whatever level we encouraged them for their projects to do an action research project on something to do with their interests and what was going on at the nursery and then we uses, use the documented results from that to input into practice so I mean there are just loads we had stuff around um, well, Felicity did the things on supervision, then we had things about key workers and attachment. We had stuff about um, equal equalities. We had things about curriculum and practice, um, how staff felt about their work, children's response to different things, but all of them did have a record and a document and they came out with certain conclusions, which we tried to implement if they were based in the nursery which we tried to encourage people to do and that was really useful because not only did it value the practitioners as people who were critiquing and enhancing practice but also it was a response to us to our local needs and strengths not sort of something out in the ether that wasn't relevant so can I just pop in and say, Sorry, Mary. yeah, if I could just pop back in, you've reminded me, Steph, that one of the richest areas was the fact that I could wander out into the garden, which was, you know, if I was missing in action, I was actually out in the garden, as you know, and sit out there and I would often have a notebook with me because I was an observer too. And the children were fascinated. So, you know, my notebook usually went absent because someone wanted to draw in it or write on it or make marks on it but you know it was that wonderful sense that a person just sitting in the garden or, and just waiting being quiet and just listening or just looking at something interesting the path or something in the pond all of that drew children to that and they were interested as well and communicated then in all sorts of ways including modeling themselves and taking my notebook and making marks in it because they saw that was something I seemed to value so, you know, there was always this learning outside as well as inside. Hmm. But also, Marion, just mm -hmm. you remember you came to the pet, the adult groups that oh, I yes. ran. Yes, indeed, that was fascinating. And, 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 you know, again, to give another perspective on how 
the dynamic was in that adult group that again I, I describe in the book so I won't won't mm -hmm. describe it now but it was just useful to have Marion there to say to mm -hmm. me afterwards did you notice you know and it's that gentle prodding that she talks about which was so helpful because actually no I hadn't noticed that you know because you can't notice everything um, and it's so useful to have somebody else to, from a different perspective looking at what you're doing. Mm. And I think so useful for all of us to have examples of your action research projects, which I um, feel sound deeply respectful to the children and their interests and indeed to your colleagues as well when you were talking about supervision. It's wonderful to have those um, documented in your book for the rest of us to, to, to learn about as well as, of course, the, the primary task of them. Um, helping you to grow and learn with the children and the families and one another in your practice. So thank you for sharing those. Um, would you like to move on to the next phase? Are you feeling ready to move on or is there anything else you'd like to say about action research before we do move on? Uh, I think move on. People can read the book and see. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll hand over to you then. And I believe um, that you're going to talk about uh, the relevance of, of the book for today. So uh, over to you. Thank you. Okay, I'll just whiz through because I know that we're running about out of time. But on reflection, during the writing of this book, it really um, clarified for me that the whole ethos that we were interested in developing was built on the importance of relationships. So relationships between the children, between the adults, between the adults and children, between people outside. So all that notion of the importance of relationships and the interactions, which reflect Frobel's ideas on the importance of knowing oneself, the importance of knowing your friends, your family and your community, and the importance of knowing the wider world around you. And I think that that informally um, was explicit in what we did really. I was involved in the, depart in the development of the curriculum. And again, we sought not to have a subject-based curriculum. We wanted something that was um, based on the locality, the strengths of the locality. And that's why we chose, as Marion said, dispositions, because we thought that we could look for the strengths of the local community and the um, challenges and use that as a starting point for developing a curriculum and a pedagogy. And the priority list was part of that interest and relationships, always putting the child at the center. That was number one. Um, and also other things that helped relationships, but also helped the development of pedagogy. So doing peer observations was really, really helpful. I mean, we did that from when we'd done the effective learning project, they changed over times, but the emphasis was always on what can you learn from your colleague? How can you build on your colleague's strengths? So it wasn't like a judgment of somebody, it was how to make the best out of the resources that we had in terms of people resources. Um, and again, that feeds into the action research. Lots of people were interested in looking at their colleagues and building on that. And to do with the curriculum, I think I did a bit of research on thinking about um, how practitioners felt about a centre-based curriculum alongside a national curriculum. What positive things were they? And all of them, all of the people I interviewed, all thought that it was the process, the process of sharing your own thoughts, your own observations of children, getting feedback from your colleagues, developing a common view of a definition of what children should learn and how adults should, should support them. That was the strongest thing. And also, I think having regular annual reviews of what we did, which Marion helped us through, of, of the curriculum, having annual reviews of that meant we could be flexible to change because they were all based on observations of actual children in known places. So as the dem demography changed, then the observations changed and our response could change with it. So I think that gave us a, a flexible response to relationships with children and 
between children. Um, and hopefully that rooted us in a sort of Hebelian approach to value practitioners. So I'll pass on to Felicity, as it's a bit of a rush at the end, who's going to talk about the challenges for the future and resilience. Uh, yes, at the end of the book, we try and bring um, our learning together and how it is relevant today. And as, as Steph has talked about, the relationships are so important. And, and, and we also felt that building resilience was really important <clears throat> and so important today when, you know, when I went to school, I sort of knew that I was going to get a job and be in that job probably for the rest of my life. But whereas today, the world is so different. Children really don't know what's going to be happening. And if you teach a very um, subject-based curriculum on facts and knowledge all the way through education, that's not really, you don't know what's going to happen in the future. So how is that preparing? So what we wanted to do, and through our dispositional curriculum as well, we wanted to build up children's resilience. And one of our dispositions was persistence. Uh, because we noticed that when um, we first went to Erlen, um, children used to give up all the time or eat, didn't even try. They used to just say, I can't do that, can't do that. And we really wanted to give them the, the strategies to show them that you can do it. And if it goes wrong, it really doesn't matter. We'll learn from what's gone wrong and put it right if we can. Um, and so the disposition of persistence, I think, really helped children build that resilience because they knew that if it hadn't worked, it wasn't the end of the world, that they could try something else or they could modify what they'd done. And perhaps by just changing it a little bit, it would open up new opportunities. Um, and actually, Froebel was a great one for modifying. He used to, um, when he asked children to play with his gifts, to be with his gifts, he would ask them to use all the parts of the gift and then to modify it, not to knock it down and start again. And I think modification and modifying your thinking and modifying your understanding is something perhaps we've lost and something that is key to children being persistent and resilient. And I think also we needed to learn to be resilient ourselves. Um, and not just to roll over and say, yes, we're going to do that. Um, and, and so having strategies, so having really clear principles and our priority list for children and having discussed it all and our vision with governors who were very supportive and parents, we felt confident to say no if it wasn't right for us. And... I think that's really important um, now because we're being, I feel one of the challenges is that we're being told more and more what we should be doing with children by, dare I say it, people who perhaps don't know. So it's important for us to be resilient and feel that we can say no because actually we know our children better than anybody else. We know our families, we know our communities better than anybody else. So building resilience in the children and building resilience in yourself, your staff, but also building resilience in your community is really important. So we, the things that we did around listening to each other and um, the supervision process, and um, which, which was not about um, what you do. It was about asking provocative questions. It was a bit like Marianne on a regular basis saying, oh, why do you think you did that? And why do you think that worked so well? 
Um, so it wasn't judgmental in any way. It was about building people's confidence and challenging them gently. And that's what built resilience, I think, with the staff team. But challenges for the future, I think, are immense because we don't really know what the future's being. This year must have been so difficult for all of you in early year settings. And I, I absolutely salute you because as part of my retirement life, I'm, um, I, I moderate on both the Roehampton course and the Edinburgh course. And, and some of the things that I've read in the, the students' um, um, assignments have been amazing about how they have managed in this very difficult time to continue to support those children individually for their individual needs and their families. So, you know, it's been a, a tough year. And I think on, in the future, we still don't know the future of nursery schools. Um, we still, you know, have a, a quite a low status. Um, governments still feel, I think, early years is, what is early years really, you know? Um, to get people back to work. <laughs> yes, it is to get people back to work. Um, and and it's, we have that, that system in this country where our education system is built on work. Whereas in other countries like the Scandinavian system, their education system is built on citizenship and it gives it a completely different focus and it is about the community, the family, the child at the centre. Um, so we have to work with what we've got and we work with our, our system which isn't ideal but I would urge you to read the book because it may give you just one strategy that will really help you in challenging and changing times. Um, so I'm going to, I think, hand over to Marion now because she is going to talk to you about her changing role from critical friend to being a mentor for our book. So Marion, over to you. Thanks, Felicity. Um, yes, how did I move from being the critical friend in the nursery to the mentor of this book? Well, I think I see this adventure in mentoring as just a later stage in the critical friend role. Um, it did seem to me, as we three moved away from Earlham and our professional commitments there, that firstly, it was essential to record I think I'd put that in capital letters, to record what was achieved or what was attempted by using all the photos, the sketches, the notes and the stories that had come out of it. Um, and it seems to me that much excellent and really innovative early years practice still goes unsung and unshared. And this is a failure in our sector. I, and because of this, we're often constantly ignored or undervalued as Felicity was just saying, and Steph. Um, it also seemed to me absolutely crucial that we share all the reflective practice with other practitioners, perhaps tonight we're doing that, I hope, with families and with our communities. And it seems to me that the sharing of what we've done is a professional responsibility. Um, we do believe, the three of us, that we should be also um, explore and celebrate the history and the very long traditions of early childhood practice. That makes our book different. And it's certainly very different from the kind of training that many young people get now if they want to be early as educators. They are not in fact exposed to the history and the long traditions of early childhood practice. Traditions that evolved, you know, in the wider world from the 18th century onwards. So we want to include the stories of our specific learning communities as part of this important ongoing history. I think of it as inserting the local into the international. And I think that's another thing we should care about. Um, certainly Earlham has changed me. It influenced me, it challenged me, and it transformed my own research and thinking. And much of this is reflected 
in the fourth edition of my book, which is still published and used a lot. Um, and, you know, the fourth edition of language and literacy in the early years. Um, now, in the fourth edition, most of the photos and the learning stories come from Earlham and from this experience, which is now in its own book. So um, it's really important that I want to say that, that I also have had to learn and have loved learning at Earlham. Um, in fact, I was very proud to set out some of my thoughts in the foreword to the book. Um, and I think in the foreword, I tried to express um, something of my great pleasure in the project. My hope is that it inspires families and practitioners to put young children at the heart of the educational project and not let official guidance and requirements be at the forefront of their thinking. Um, and I'm going to end by saying that my own continuing belief, and it always has been one, is that we've got to be fearless. We have to decline to implement inappropriate and damaging interventions into children's lives. And it's lovely that Felicity was sort of ran in on this and I want to conclude with that point. Thank you. Okay, over to over to Sasha, are we? For questions. Thank you very much, all of you. Um, a, a absolutely fascinating and hugely wide ranging and uh, deeply thoughtful presentation that reflects the same characteristics in your book and indeed so much more in the book. And I think as, as Felicity said, um, if you uh, do read the book, you may find even just one, but probably many more than one strategy for these very challenging times. So I do urge you uh, to, to take advantage of uh, the free uh, copy of the book. Um, we have had lots of comments coming in um, uh, throughout this last section and I'd just like to relay a few of these comments to you in the last few moments of the webinar. Um, uh, from um, Distant Shores, um, delighted to say we have a comment from Suzanne Quinn and welcome to Suzanne, thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, Suzanne says, thank you for the great work and especially the thoughtful examples of unity in action and as a principle to, to guide decisions and practices. And I think it was a fantastic, uh, the whole presentation is a fantastic example of, of unity in action and indeed, your long-term relationship with one another and support for one another is another example of that um, unity in action. Um, uh, and Tansy Watts says, thank you, lovely reference to the, the living development of practice. I think that's something that we need to hold in mind. Um, We've also had a comment from Jill Kotup, who uh, says, not a question, but a comment. This has been so thought provoking and inspiring. I can't wait to read the book. The webinar has really lifted my spirits. And I think congratulations to all of you, because at the moment, um, lifting people's spirits is certainly something that we um, are delighted to be able to uh, achieve. And Stella Louis has commented on how very Frobelian um, it is in, in the ways that you have been providing education that enables thought. And not, not just for the children, but of course for, for everyone who has been involved in the um, Earlham community. Uh, Maureen Brookson has said, uh, this presentation has been so uplifting and demonstrates how relevant this view of early childhood is and always has been so powerful. There are so many resonances with our current times and how research-based knowledge and understanding support, supports and sustains us. And uh, lastly, <laughs> Oh, no, beg your pardon, two more comments. Um, uh, Tina Bruce says books are hugely used on all Froebel courses, including South Africa and India. And, uh, uh, and indeed, of course, um, the, the uh, short courses where um, the uh, settings are uh, supported and encouraged to read some of the resources that the Trust uses, but also to, to reach more widely. And I hope that your book will be included, and I'm sure it will. Um, we do have one question, which is, uh, what is your vision about the importance of sharing and exporting this kind of practice abroad? And that comes from uh, Daniel Garrido Cordoba. Oh, Daniel. Um, I know the Frobel Trust has a vision 
for uh, exporting this sort of thinking abroad. And I was lucky enough to volunteer for the Frobel Trust and work in Kolkata in India, um, where I was able to share Frobelian principles and this sort of working based around unity and bringing people together um, and putting the child and the child's needs at the center. Um, I hope that the book will, because it's a, an internet publication online, I hope the book itself will go all around the world, but obviously it's written in English. Um, uh, but hopefully it will be wider than just an English audience. I don't know if anybody else has anything you want to add to that. You know, just to echo that that you just said, really, Felicity, that this is a way of um, sharing our experience and hopefully, even though it's only in, in English, some of it will provoke thought and also promote different ways of working, make people feel enabled that they're able to do a similar sort of thing in whatever setting they find themselves in. Yes, I, I think it's... Um, another voice, isn't it? It's another voice that's saying things can be different, you can do things differently. And I think that sort of questioning will be equally valued internationally as well. And I do hope so. And that mm. process, the, the, mm. the important thing is not the outcome, it's the process. Yeah, absolutely, the process. Things, which mm. you apply to children and to adults. So mm. hopefully that's something that be helpful. Indeed, well I'm just going to finish then and draw us to a close with one final comment from Sue Daniels who also says um, that uh, the presentation has been very inspiring and she looks forward to reading the book. Um, so I'd like to thank all three of you very much indeed um, for the book for all your work that went into uh, the book and uh, and indeed the work that you did that meant the book was possible, um, but also for today's webinar. We're very grateful to have had this opportunity to launch the book with the authors and uh, the author's mentor. So thank you very much, all three of you for joining us. And thank you to all our audience members as well for joining us today. Um, the recording will be available, I would hope on the website in a couple of days time. So do look out for that. And um, as, as we close the webinar, um, a little survey will pop up and we just ask for your feedback. And we'd be very grateful for any and all feedback. It helps us to keep on learning ourselves about this new technology of webinars and so forth. Uh, so with that, I think we will uh, bid you all farewell and wish you a, a good evening. And uh, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye.